Uh, yeah, my question for you is, obviously, the areas of, of kind of legal practice that you need help with are, you know, Freedom of Information Act, records requests, mm -hmm. and then also kind of criminal procedure things, like yeah. when a warrant is necessary. What yeah. other kind of areas of legal expertise? Do journalists need? Are, are you going to, yeah. Me personally? You, you and, and just generally what you're doing, yes, yeah. journalists. So, yeah. like, a lot of times when I'm working on a story, like license plate readers, I know there's like a cod or stingrays. This is stuff I talked about. There's like a cadre of, of lawyers and law professors that I turn to. Um, <laughs> Professor Joe here at UC Davis is somebody I turn to a lot. Um, uh, you know who who know this area of the law much better than I do. And and uh, you know as I've been doing it for a couple of years now, I'm starting to feel like I'm getting the hang of it. But I'm not a trained lawyer. I'm not. I don't have a law degree. I'm not barred anywhere. Um, you know. But usually it's it's where. A case, like a decision has come down, and I read it, and my first question will be to these people is like, here's what I've understood from reading this decision. Do I understand it correctly? Like, what do I need to know about this that maybe is not immediately obvious to, to a layperson, you know? Um, and what are the kinds of other, are there typically, you know, uh, there are cases that are referred to that maybe are not immediately obvious. I mean, fortunately, there's you know, Wikipedia and other things that like help me as somebody familiarize myself. And then oftentimes, I'm sure you as a law student maybe do this all the time, is then you find yourself, okay, I have to go read, you know, footnote 25 and look up, you know, what is Jones all about? What is Kylo all about? What is, you know, like Riley versus California? What's that all about? Like, and I have to, you know, do that. Um, or if it's a, you know, if it's a case that I haven't been following for a long period of time, I have to go back and I have to read the original complaint or I have to read, you know, something like that. So oftentimes it's, I mean, lawyers, law students, law professors are plugged into the legal universe in a way that I'm not, right? You guys typically have access to things like Westlaw and other kinds of things. You're getting law journals. You know, like, what the kind of cutting edge of the law is in maybe a way that I don't. Um, you're getting the notice that says, oh, the Fourth Circuit decided this, or the Ninth Circuit decided that, or there's this case coming up here. Or, you know, for me, it's like, it's, it's I would say, answering questions that I have about the law. Like, what is the law? What is the what are what is the case law saying? It's also like flagging the issues. Like, hey, you journalist, person who writes things, you know, did you know that this thing is also happening? And that's like what the ACLU and the EFF do. And I've gotten to know a couple of the lawyers that, like me, are equally obsessed with these issues, like the readers and stingrays. Um, so if, if there's a particular area of law, whether it's public records or stingrays or privacy or whatever it is, um, if you're interested in that field, I would advise you to find a journalist who is also interested in those things, who you can kind of partner with um, and, you know, like help educate, you know, about, about how the law works. I mean, one of the things that I love about my job is that my job is to learn stuff and then tell people what I learned. That's basically what my job is. Um, and that's awesome. And I, you know, I'm not, I don't feel like an expert in the law or, or, or a lot of other things. Um, so I would, you know, if that's something that like you, you know, if you come across cases, if you're working on a case, if you know about a case, if there's something, talk to me or there's, a lot, there's lots of other people that do what I do. Um, and help us because we really need it. <laughs> um, and like I've met, you know, if you're willing to take, if when you get barred, I assume you're not barred yet, when, when you're barred, um, and you want to take cases, like, so I know a thing that, that, that some lawyers do is they'll do cases on contingency, right? So, for example, I know a guy in San Francisco who's very interested in stingrays, and he's been trying using public records to go to San Francisco PD and ask for records regarding stingrays. And San Francisco PD says, no, you can't have them under XYZ exemptions, right? Um, so then he's working with a, a lawyer of all places in Chicago who, on contingency, takes these kinds of cases. So if that's a thing that interests you, um, there's a number of people, um, privacy activists, journalists, people like that, who who need that kind of weapon. Uh, I was just saying with somebody earlier, is like the records process, the FOIA process is really slow and it's frustrating. Um, and you know, and and um, you know, and, and I found that the only way that you get, especially at the federal level, the only way that you get these agencies really to give up to give up the goods is to sue them. You know, and the, and the ACLU is really good at that. The EFF is really good at that. But there needs to be, you know, a hundred times more of people like that who are doing that kind of work. 
um, in my opinion. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Great question. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I hope that was and really now Chris will be up I'll, next. I'll ask. Oh, thank oh. you. Thank you very much for yeah, being absolutely. here. Absolutely. Hey, yeah. did I give you a card? Uh, I have one. Yes. Okay, cool. And I will probably email you. Great. Yep. And Chris, so I have the most important question, uh -oh. which is not going to coffee. Oh, just a regular black coffee would be perfect. Actually, okay. iced coffee. I still iced coffee. Thank you. Thank you. So, hey, I'm just quickly Yes. I'm interested in. Because you just answered the question having to do with the fact that you uh, do a lot of research on these different cases. Uh -huh. The law thinks in a very different way when it's reasonable right. as what you might have thought as reasonable. Uh, right. So can you tell me about some of the tensions that you get between what you think as reasonable as yeah. opposed to what the law is? The law tends to bring us in to frame the whole discourse in its own terms. Right. And we want to resist that in some way right. too, right? Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that knowing what the law considers, like, okay, so a good example of this is um, the third party doctrine, right? I, when I first heard about the third party doctrine, um, and I'll, I'll explain for posterity what the third party doctrine, do you want me to do that or no? Um, for, for the purposes of this? Sure, why not? Okay, yeah. so the third party doctrine is this idea that if you are, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is this idea that like when you are um, transacting in some way with somebody, making a phone call, for example, if I call my wife, the fact that I had to use uh, AT&T to connect that call, AT&T is the third party in the situation, and I have essentially given up to this third party the fact that I made this call. Therefore, I have no inherent privacy interest over that call, and therefore, because it is now in the hands of AT&T, or AT&T has that record of that call, uh, I have no privacy interest over that, I think, is basically what it is. Um, and so the government has argued in many of these uh, NSA surveillance cases, metadata cases, and so forth, that because of the third party doctrine, um, you don't have a privacy interest over your email or over your metadata or whatever. And I would argue that that's ridiculous. I, I think that, that just because I'm, I'm transacting via, via this third party, that doesn't mean that I don't have a privacy interest over that, what I would consider to be a private communication, right? And I think that most people, when they're making a phone call, do not expect that the records of that phone call, whether it's the metadata or the content, and that also, to me, is a bizarre distinction, that, that under the law, there's a distinction between the, the metadata, uh, which is governed by the third party doctrine largely, versus the contents, which is governed by wiretap law and, and interception. Um, that we make this distinction. So I, I sort of feel like data is data. It shouldn't matter what kind it is. Um, and as we've seen, metadata is very, very powerful. And yet the law treats metadata as something lesser than the contents, right? Um, and I would say that metadata, the government wouldn't be collecting metadata if it wasn't useful. So uh, if it's not, if it's useful, then we should give it the same, we should treat it the same as we treat other kinds of things. So I, I think that that's an area where I think the law as it stands right now is getting it wrong, in my opinion, um, because I think that that's not how, I don't think most people, when they pick up their phone and they call their loved ones, they think, oh, well, you know, the fact that I like made this call for two minutes, that's not private, but the fact that I called, like what I said when I was on the phone, on my, on the phone with my wife, that's private. Like nobody thinks like that, right? You think that your call is private, right? Your your correspondence is private, um, and if you choose to share it, that's your business. But like, there shouldn't be, um, you know, this this bizarre way uh, in which the government can get access to a tiny portion of that. And I think this goes back to what I was saying earlier, which is that like, you know, like the, you know, the we don't have this debate in this country about like whether or not that's appropriate. You know, the law sort of evolves and the law and where takes time. do you time. think that debate could take place? I think that debate takes place in institutions like this. I think it takes place in the media. I think it takes place in politics. I think it takes place in lots of institutions. Um, I think that it, it, it uh, you know, there should be more politicians, again, ranging from Congress down to city, city council, saying, hey, like, you know, we, you know, we're not gonna we're, we're not gonna do this. If a city like Davis or Oakland or New York City or wherever wanted to, you know, assert uh, assert certain rights, it, you know, give its citizens more rights than than um, you know are otherwise granted, it could do so. I mean, look at the example of Oakland is one of many cities around the country that has declared itself to be a sanctuary city, saying that they will not expend city resources to deport undocumented immigrants uh, into their cities. Um, the city of Oakland has even taken that a step further and issues 
identification cards that are issued by the city to whoever wants one. I have one. I'm, I'm a U.S. citizen, but I got one just to get one, just to see. But, you know, if you have an Oakland address and you, and you have, let's say, a Mexican uh, consular ID, you can get one of these City of Oakland issued ID cards. That's only valid. That's only useful in the City of Oakland. But still, um, it's, it's, as far as like the Oakland police are concerned, they should accept that as a, as a government ID. Um, so in the same way, a city could say, we are not going to, um, you know, collect metadata. We're not going to use stingrays. We're not, you know, we're going to impose a stringer stand, a st more stringent standard on our law enforcement than otherwise exists. Great. Um, okay, I'm going to let okay. pass to the next question. Thanks. My pleasure. Sure. Please. <laughs> Batter up. Hi again. <laughs> I'm going to move this. They probably don't care about my iced coffee. What's up? <laughs> so I was wondering if you could speak at all to some of the sort of like newer moves in surveillance in Oakland and moves towards further like automated policing. Like I, specifically, I know that the FBI has given, you know, the OPD, what is it, $110,000, $112,000 to create this new state-of-the-art surveillance facility, specifically looking at like social media. Yeah. Um, and and the, I think they're talking about adopting PredPol software, yeah. policing software. Yeah. And I didn't know if you could speak at all to that. Yeah, well, there's lots of, of things that are happening in Oakland with their respect. I believe what you're referring to in the first part of your question was the what's called the DAC, the Domain Awareness Center, maybe? Yeah. So yeah. the Domain Awareness Center was this surveillance uh, kind of local fusion center. There are these larger fusion centers that exist in other parts of the country that essentially act as sort of one-stop shopping for law enforcement in different jurisdictions. In the Bay Area, um, uh, there is something called the uh, Northern California Regional Intelligence Center, NICRIC. Um, which sits in San Francisco and is the Northern California Fusion Center. So if, let's say, the FBI was investigating me and they wanted my license plate meter data and they wanted other kinds of police intelligence that had been gathered on me, rather than go to the Oakland Police Department and the Berkeley Police Department and the San Francisco Police Department and all these other agencies individually, they just go to one and they, that acts as sort of the nexus for that area. Um, they pushed through an update, right? So that was in May, late May, from the city council? Right, but so hang on. Okay. Yes, so the DAC is, the, the Domain Awareness Center, is kind of an even smaller version of what I just described. Okay. So the DAC um, was originally, as it was originally conceived, was going to be a federally funded um, surveillance setup for uh, the port. It was originally conceived of for the Port of Oakland, and the Port of Oakland um, which includes the airport and, and adjacent land, um, uh, is a large area. Um, originally it was conceived to, to, in the name of port security, right? Ports could be a theoretical terrorism target. Okay, fine. Um, where it got into questions, and I think where people started um, raising a lot of, uh, lot of questions uh, and protesting the city, was when it came out that the city wanted to then expand it to reach and encompass the entire city. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a there was a particular uh, PowerPoint slide that got released that um, you know wanted to include uh, not only license plate readers and other kinds of police surveillance, but also surveillance cameras from Oakland schools, from OUSD schools, um, from other types of devices. Uh, Oakland uses um, another sensory device called a shot spotter, which is designed to detect gunshots. That's um, you know, and, and alert police when there's gunfire. Um, this is used in other cities as well. Um, and basically tie all of these things into one nice big package so that the city could accurately, you know, manage the surveillance. The problem is, is that all of this happened right after Snowden, so like summer 2013. Mm -hmm. And so there was big protests and stuff and so, and so on. What ended up happening was that the city and, and a lot of these activists ended up agreeing that the DAC could exist, but that it would be scaled back to just encompass the port. Right. Um, so that's good. Um, you know, I, I, there's a there's definitely a group of people. I mean, Oakland has now, under the purview of the city council, a privacy committee whose mm -hmm. job it is is to like look closely at these issues and draft policies and stuff, um, so that the city can try to be as respectful of civil liberties as they can be. Um, with respect to uh, pr uh, predictive policing, credpol, um, I think that I don't believe that the city is looking at it. Or excuse me, I don't believe that the city has implemented it yet. I think that they that they may be looking at it. I mean, Oakland. This is the thing about Oakland is like, you know, it's. I imagine it's a hard job to be the police chief of Oakland. It's a hard job to be mayor of Oakland, right? You have serious crime issues that need to be dealt with um, in concentrated in certain parts of the city. 
um, Oakland has been doing using all kinds of things, not just surveillance technology, but they've been using things like Operation Ceasefire and like other kinds of non-technical, non-technological solutions as a way to mitigate violence and a way to mitigate criminal activity. Um, and I think anybody who lives in Oakland or anybody who spends time in Oakland wants that to happen. I certainly, you know, as of today, I believe the murder, there have been 70 people murdered in the city of Oakland in 2015, um, more than were murdered last year. Um, so we all want the police to be able to do their job and, and, and stop violent, serious crime from happening and certainly stop terrorism, God forbid, should there ever be terrorism in Oakland. But I don't think that we should, uh, you know, have to employ um, indiscriminate technologies that are collecting data on people um, and can reveal patterns of behavior in ways that um, are maybe revealing. Uh, and and I think the, the OPD, and I'm not faulting them for this, I, it's, it's frankly, it's not their job to, to make the privacy considerations and to make the civil liberties considerations. It should be, in my view, the job of the city council and the job of the citizenry, the voters. Um, to to better understand and sort of thing, um, and so it's uh, you know it's it's really really tricky, um, and I don't I don't claim to have all the answers. Um, what I've been able to learn uh, about how some of this stuff works in Oakland is very very interesting, but there's still a lot I don't know. There's still a lot that a lot you know that lawyers don't know. There's a lot that um, the FBI won't say that that the OPD won't say you know like they won't let me for example one of the things that I'm saying about body cameras one of the things that I would like to do uh, in Oakland or frankly anywhere else um, is to do a ride along with an Oakland police officer could be any day any time anywhere um, and ride with them for two hours four hours however long and then compare my experience with my own two eyes with whatever the body camera from that officer sees and like basically just as a test like like do, what does it capture what does it not capture what does it show what does it not show because i imagine the camera is going to see a lot of stuff that i'm going to see or maybe see and forget you know um and so i that's a that's a story i would love to write and and i'm and i'm frustrated that you know oakland and other police departments that i've asked have said no they won't let me do that um i don't know why i don't know why that they I don't know if they think it's a liability issue. I don't know. I don't know what it is. I've done right. I, when I was in graduate school, I did a ride along with the NYPD ten years ago, and it was fine. Nothing happened. Um, I sat in the back of the car and I watched them do stuff. Right. You know. Um, you know. It, it wouldn't need to be like a car chase. It wouldn't need to be anything like super dramatic. Right. Um, a regular everyday. That's what I want. You know. I just yeah. want like what? Do, what does this look like? You know. And I think that's a very basic question to ask. Yeah. Um, and so yeah. So. Um, yeah, that's helpful. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. <laughs> Cheers. Thanks for coming today. Sure, my job. pleasure. My pleasure. Yeah, my work in part looks at this stuff, so I'm always very interested in it. Yeah. <coughs> Are you I, up now? I, oh, I man. think so. Do you need I me to do the, anything? I just, you can just look through. I think we're okay, I'll do the creepy yeah. surveilling. <laughs> yeah, uh, not really a question. Um, sort of getting at, there were a couple comments in there about uh, the, you know, finding the bad guys, or we want the police to have the resources. Um, but at a certain point, the way the quantitative data works, it's really sort of how whatever the algorithm directs, that's what it catches. I mean, you give the example of the um, the lights, the stoplights that just collect based on your car's position and mm -hmm. uh, apply or like velocity calculation. Yeah. yeah. Would they have broken this law? If, right. And there's a certain level in which the the idea of good and bad is, is relegated to binary. Yeah, to yeah. a sort of a, a movement of the code in which right it really becomes right. interesting that your capacity to search. Like right. In, in what way do you do search? So I guess maybe just speak a little yeah. generally towards that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think this idea of automated or robotic law enforcement is is really interesting. Um, I, I, I mean, red light cameras and speed cameras are kind of the tip of the iceberg. You know, like I mean. If you think about, if you think about, like, what does the law say about speeding, right? We're right next to I-80, right here in, in Davis. Uh, on this part of I-80, I would guess that the speed limit is probably 65 or 70 miles an hour, right? So the law says you can't go one nanometer faster than that, or one nanometer per second faster than that. Um, you know, under the law, that's what how you should be prosecuted for it. But in reality, as everyone who's ever driven this stretch of road knows. 
if you go five miles an hour, seven miles an hour, maybe even ten miles an hour faster, you probably won't be busted for it, right? Kind of like last night, I was, yeah. I was ten miles with someone else yeah, at fifteen. Right? So yeah, right? Yeah. So exactly. So like, and and we just know that as like we know that living in society, there are laws that exist on the books. And we know that in some situations, we're just not going to be prosecuted for them. We're not going to be stopped for breaking that law. I jaywalk all the time, and I've like never been ticketed for jaywalking ever in my life. You know, uh, probably you have too. And and you know, so if we enter into a world where there is a machine that is programmed to automatically issue tickets based on the fact that you have now exceeded the 65 mile an hour speed limit by one mile an hour and is going to get you every single time uh that's a little bit weird like i mean and maybe we as a maybe maybe we as a society say well we're okay with that because it means we'll have so many less you know crashes or we'll have so many less people dying on the roads because everybody we're sure is obeying the law but you know like that's a that's a hard question to answer i think um, in the same way uh, of, of with respect to yeah like like red light cameras and red light cameras are even weirder I didn't get into this in there but what makes that situation so bizarre is that you have there's a company uh, Redflex it's an Australian company that has come to the U.S. and makes this proposition to cities like Oakland or Modesto or Fresno I think they use actually I know they use them outside of Sacramento in Citrus Heights and some of the other suburbs they say look you know no. Let's, uh, let's work together and reduce traffic accidents and help people from getting seriously injured or killed. Again, everybody wants there to be less traffic accidents in the world. So they say, okay, we're going to install these machines. We're going to, you know, at the red lights and stuff. And we, the company Redflex, will take a cut of every ticket that is issued based on these machines. So that creates a weird incentive program for them because they profit every time people are violating the law. So what they argue, the, the case that they make publicly is they say, well, we want to reduce the number of what are called T-bone crashes, right? So where somebody is just running the light, zooming through, and you're coming along, mind your own business, and bam, you get taken out, right? And that's bad. What ends up happening is most of the tickets that get up, that end up getting issued are people that are making slow, you know, right on red type turns, you know, where they're like rolling through it like four miles an hour, Nobody's around, they've checked, it's safe, nothing bad has happened. And yet, under the law, they've broken the law, right? Because they didn't come to a complete stop for three seconds or whatever it is. And, you know, the camera saw that, and boom, you get nailed. Um, and so that's what ends up happening. Um, and it becomes a funding source. For it becomes a funding source. <laughs> and then there's been cases of corruption in Chicago and Columbus and Cincinnati, where the company has basically, as a way to get these big contracts, has funneled money illegally to lobbyists and stuff in these cities. and. The woman who used to be the CEO of Redflex in the U.S. Uh, is now has been indicted on federal charges in Ohio and in Illinois um, uh, for for this this case. Um, but I think that that this this is definitely a world that that we're going you know toward, and especially as we move toward um, you know talking about cars, we now we now live in a world where Google and other companies are testing. Uh, you know, cars that have no human driver on real roads in real world situations every day. Um, you have situations where, um, you know, if you believe Google's uh, self generated reports, Google has said that they've driven something like a million miles in the last five years, I think it is, and they've gotten involved in 13 car accidents, and they claim that none of them were their fault. They claim that it was always the fault of another human driver that rear ended them or something else. Um, and, you know, and that's great. If that, assuming that that's right, um, that, that's awesome. I would love to be able to get into a self-driving car and drive to Davis or to drive wherever um, and know that it will be perfectly safe. Um, but then, but, but surely there's going to come a day when, you know, either the software malfunctions or, like, two self-driving cars, like, one of them misreads and they hit each other or something, like, there's going to be something like that. Um, and how do you establish, uh, you know, whether it's criminal liability or civil liability or other types of legal situations, how, how do you deal with that when you're talking about robots, when you're talking about software and algorithms? Well, and I, exactly. This is somewhere I'd love to jump in real quick just for a follow-up. That in this world, the binary or the algorithmic, um, the law doesn't work that way. Right. The law works much, much slower. I mean, your, yeah. your example. 